give a cheerful welcome to one of our resource person of today's international webinar dr gneeshwari sabatna madam professor mushroom research center institute of biological sciences university of malaya malaysia who accept, accepted our invitation in her busy schedule to deliver a scientific presentation on mushroom in our diets Dr. Vigneshwari Sabharatna Madam is a kind, curate, a champion of today's Hello, international webinar. Dr. Vigneshwari Sabharatna Madam, mushroom Professor, Bioremedy Mushroom Research Center, Biology, Institute of Biological Sciences, University of Malaya, Malaysia, Malaysia who accept, accepted our invitation by the basic schedule to deliver a scientific presentation on Mushroom in our diet. Management principal, sir, faculties, students of our college, we wholeheartedly welcome you, madam. Welcome, madam. It's my pleasant duty to give you a cheerful welcome to our second uh, resource person of today's webinar, Dr. J. Seelan, Satya Seelan, Senior Lecturer, Institute for Tropical Biology and Conservation, University, Malaysia, Sabah, Malaysia. Who accepted our invitation in his busy research activities and delivered a scientific talk on mushroom poisoning? A correct identification is must. On behalf of our management, principal, sir, faculties, students of our college, we welcome you, sir. Next, I extend my heartiest welcome to the scientists, faculty members, research scholars from other institutions, non-teaching staff members, students from from our own college and other college. Once again, I extend a warm and cordial welcome to one and all. Thank you. Sophia, madam. Thank you for your gracious welcome, sir. Fragrance of flowers spread only in the direction of wind, but the goodness of a person spreads in all direction. Such an inspiring person is our beloved principal, Dr. S. Madhivanan, sir. Now it's, now it's my pleasure to invite our principal, sir, for felicitation. Thank you, ma'am. Am I audible? Audible, sir. But yes, audible, sir. sir. Video? Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Education illuminates us with the lights of knowledge and wisdom. Great morning to one and all gathered here in this webinar. I am glad and feel proud to felicitate the one day virtual international webinar on Mushroom Well, organized by the Department of Microbiology of our college in this Silver Jubilee year. Since 1997, our college has earned considerable appreciation for importing the ideals of academic and non-academic activities, sense of discipline, high moral and ethical values. We stand for the best in academics and for unending pursuit of excellence in higher education for the students, particularly from rural areas. The microbiology department of our college was established in the year 1999 and further it was upgraded as the postgraduate department in the year 2006. I am deeply gratified to share that our microbiology department has successfully produced 20 batches, which holds more than 100 rank holders and three who had created laurels to our college. I am elated to demonstrate that the alumni of the Department of Microbiology created as academicians, researchers in national and international institutions far and wide throughout the world and also placed in various government and private sectors too. It is a program is arranged in I take it as my great privilege to introduce the resource person Professor Dr. Vikineswari Sabharatnam, FAS, Mushroom Research Center, Institute of Biological Sciences, University Malaya, Malaysia, who hold 
more than 20, 32 years of research experience and also the teaching experience. An amicable and acted as a resource person in an international webinar organized by our college on mushroom, nature's gift in our diet last year, which has received an excerpt about to deliver on oration regarding the nutritional and the dietary values of mushrooms today. Then I would like to refer Dr. Jayasilan Satyasilan, Senior Lecturer, researchers, Researcher, Institute of Tropical Biology and Conservation, University Malaysia Sabah, Malaysia, who has 15 years of research and his enunciation is to bring out the toxic effects of mushroom under the title Mushroom Poisoning, Accurate Identification is a Must. I take this opportunity to welcome and thank the resource persons, Dr. Vikineswari Sabharatnam and Dr. Jaisilan Satyasilan, who has accepted our invitation in spite of their busiest schedule in sharing their knowledge and research experience in the field of mushroom in today's webinar. I take it as my earnest responsibility in thanking both the resource personalities for extending their benevolent support to our college and I presume that the same in the upcoming years too. As Paul Stamlet says, mushrooms are miniature pharmaceutical factories that have a unique combination of talents to improve our health. I am certain that this international webinar is about to create an upheaval enormous entrepreneurs in mushroom cultivation. It enhances the health and the wealth of the entire human community. In this auspicious occasion, let me congratulate the young dynamic team members of microbiology department of our college for organizing such a program for the benefit of creating scientists of life science discipline from different institutions in India as well as in abroad. Finally, in this moment of great gladness, I would like to conclude by wishing you all, wishing you all the best and warm greetings. Let us pave way for the students to stand high with confidence. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your words, sir. People who feel about themselves do great work and create great things. Such personalities are with us in this webinar. Now I request Dr. M. Sanjeev Kumar, sir, Assistant Professor, Department of Microbiology, to introduce the guest speaker for the first session. Thank you, madam. It's my pleasure to introduce our one of the chief guests, Professor Dr. Vigneshri Sabharatnam, madam. She has a honorary pro professor in of Biological Science Faculty of Biological Science, Science. University of Malaya, Malaya. Malaysia, a UG in Zoology and PG in Medical, Bi Medical Microbiology at My Mysore University, India. And also, she completed pre and post doctoral research in micro. Yes, ma'am, now we can see. Thank you so much for having us, Jay and me, to share a little bit about our work. But before that, I think it's a big honor for us to be here this morning uh, in joining you in celebrating your Singapore Jubilee. It's a long way you have come. From what Dr. Mani Vanan said, microbiology department has been doing very well, earning a lot of awards for the college. Um, before I go to I go to share my talk, I would like to here highlight that I'm not sharing hardcore data or or scientific findings because a lot of it has been published. 
and it is available in an access. What I would like to do is to share some of the gaps and also some of the things that we should be looking at or what I call uh, looking out of the box, all right? Because there's a lot more to be done for mushroom and mushroom research and whether we can steer this effort towards mushrooms being labeled as a superfood. Because now the in thing is having superfood in our diet. So I've chosen a very simple topic, mushrooms in our diet, because uh, it can be part of our food and we can take it uh, as often as we can. It may contribute to our health, right? Uh, here, I would like to also uh, let the participants know that questions, if we, because we have two talks, if questions, if none, it's better for you to key in in the chat box so we can address them as we, uh, so we don't miss out or you don't miss asking the questions, all right? So thank you again for giving me this opportunity. Uh, do join me now on a little journey as I take you through the mushroom world. Now, what are mushrooms? Now, I don't have to dwell so much into this because I have shared before. And also, I'm sure many of you know what are mushrooms and I'm sure many of you do eat mushrooms and enjoy mushrooms. Now, what are mushrooms? If you look at the life cycle here, they're actually thread-like structures. You don't see any leaves. We don't see any buds. We don't see any flowers. And these straight like structures arise from spores, the spores that come from the footing body. And when they germinate, they form two type of hypha, a positive and a negative, all right, which is, uh, we can be taken as a male, female uh, hypha, but it's not very apparent looking at the gross morphology. And if a plus and a minus do meet, karyogamy takes place, and then the dicaron is formed that initiates the formation of the footing body. All right, the footing body and on the undersurface or any other structures, the spores are produced and the life cycle continues. So Professor S.D. Chang, who is known as the mushroomologist and the father of mushroom, he said, without leaves, without buds, without flowers, yet they form fruit. We call these structures footing bodies or vestigial cards. As a food, as a tonic, as a medicine, the entire creation is precious. Now today, I'm only going to touch on the food aspect, but if you read, uh, mushrooms have multiple roles to play in our life. Now mushrooms are six kingdom. They are a kingdom of their own because they are neither plant-like or animal, though they share a lot of characteristics from these two kingdoms. They are actually macrofungi. They have a distinctive fruiting body. As you can see here, they come in all kinds of shapes, colors. Sometimes they appear overnight after a long dry spell and heavy rain. And we find that they can appear above the ground or below the ground. And they have gastronomic effects. That means people take them in culinary mushroom. Some of them are medicinal, so they range from aphrodisiac in some place or psychedelic, recently mushroom, and then to poisonous. And they have always intrigued humans for a very long time. Bringing you a little closer to where mushrooms are found, they are found normally in the jungle or on a tree stump. If you just look out for them, these glow, some of them glow at night. Okay, Dr. Jeff will touch something on this. And even at home, if you have any organic matter, dead organic matter, like a wooden sandal or even your uh, shoe brush or in your flower pot, you find that they can come up these mushrooms. So mushrooms are quite ubiquitous. At least the footing bodies, when they come up, you know the mycelium is present beneath the earth. So how many do we know? We know about 15,000, maybe plus minus, all right? And around 2,000 are considered safe to eat. 
and of these 2,000, maybe close to 1,000 are having significant pharmacological properties. Culinary and medicinal mushroom is very much the topic nowadays. And we find that we have about 14 commercially harvested wild species. That means they are not cultivated, but people collect it in the wild and it can be sold. All right, collect enough. We have more than 30 wild non-commercial edible. There are some that we don't get enough to be on a commercial scale uh, of uh, business, but you can still sell, you can still eat. Of the cultivated, of the many uh, possible mushrooms that we can eat, about 20 are being cultivated on an industrial scale. In fact, in China, if you look at their mushroom farming, it has moved from like a cottage industry to now factory sales, where it is almost like a factory churning out mushrooms. So now we're going to move into mushroom as food as a topic for today's uh, sharing. Mushroom was first cultivated in China. The first mushroom to be cultivated was the wood ear mushroom or monkey's ear, so juicy as here come many nicknames. Uh, it's also called black jelly mushroom. And this was in China in 680. The first commercial edible mushroom in the Western world was in France in the 18th century. And that is the pattern mushroom that many, many love to eat. This is the agaricus species. Global production of mushroom, uh, based on the 2012 uh, data, which I got. Production is, China is the global runner in producing mushroom. And in terms of consumption, it is US followed by the rest of the world, Germany and the rest. Now, where do we figure? Maybe we come under others, okay? Now, way back in 2004, Professor Miles and Professor S.D. Chan uh, listed the six mushrooms as the top six mushroom or the big six mushrooms which were being cultivated in 32 countries. And later on, in during the Mushroom Summit in 2012, the mushrooms were about the same only that more countries are now involved in mushroom cultivation. Right. Among the mushroom, the Pyrrhotus species, hello? Headphone. White kit, yeah. Okay, I talk near really. Huh? Okay. okay. We find that uh, mushrooms uh, in the big six include the oyster mushrooms, which are the pleurotus species, then the button, which is about 30%, followed by the shiitake mushroom. All right, the others that are in the big six are the wood ear mushroom, the straw mushroom, and the golden needle mushroom. So the world production statistics, we see that uh, button is not leading, but however, put together the oyster and the shiitake, they outdo the mushroom. Yet these are the top three mushrooms that are being cultivated and sold globally. In Malaysia, we have many mushrooms which are either being grown in Malaysia all available in the supermarket being imported. Among them, we also have button and we also have uh, shiitake, right? Oyster mushrooms dominate. We have many varieties, including the king oyster, the giant oyster, the gray and the white oysters, plus many other mushrooms, which are all edible. I have not included the medicinal mushrooms in this list. Today, mushrooms are not only considered as quality vegetable, but as food, finger food, 
vegetarian food and now even vegan food, also in soups, sauces, drinks. And some of them are also being explored for as nutraceutical, nutritional, and maybe drugs. Worldwide, mushroom cultivation is being identified to have industrial potential that can contribute to economy and balance of trade. And recently, we find that much, um, more and more mushroom cultivation is being looked at for the economy known as circular economy. That means from waste to zero waste generation. Now mushrooms as components of human food, the nutritional qualities as well as medicinal and tonic attributes of mushrooms are being explored to enhance longevity and healthy graceful aging. All right, as we age, we want to be, remain healthy. And also we have good quality life in our old age. A study was done in Singapore. It's kind of a tracer study of the population. And they found that the seniors who ate about 300 grams of cooked mushroom a week were half as likely to have mild cognitive impairment. Because as we age, loss of cognition is one of the um, worrying um, situations for the older folks. So knowledge of healthy, um, um, to remain healthy or how mushrooms can be healthy and also beneficial as we age needs to be discussed and publicized and encourage mushroom eating. Uh, excuse me, madam. Yes. Sorry for interrupting. Can you please uh, click the hide icon next to this uh, slide? The hide, yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Okay. Um, and what is this microculture? Before, we always knew mushrooms or what they didn't contain. We told, uh, we always say mushrooms are, are low sugar, no cholesterol, no fat. They are low in sodium, low glycemic index because they do not have glucose, they have mannitol. So we known mushrooms were what they didn't have. And recently, we find that more and more healthy components are being discovered. We are discovering that mushrooms are packed with vitamins, especially the B group. A lot of trace elements or micro elements, including potassium, selenium. They're high in fiber. In this case, they have chitin and also a good protein source. They also have uh, polysaccharides, which are predominantly beta glucans, and these are immunomodulating. Uh, substances or components. There have been reports that mushroom components also can reduce cholesterol, uh, can be anti-cancer uh, therapeutics, or and also very rich in antioxidant. Now, antioxidant usually is contributed by the phenolic components, also the selenium, and of late is the algothionine, which is being looked at very uh, closely worldwide. It also has several secondary metabolites, including terpenoids. This is the one that gives the bitterness to your mushroom. And these have multiple health-related functions or attributes. Where do mushrooms fit into a dietary advice? Now, mushrooms are like white vegetables such as potatoes, cauliflower, they are a forgotten source of nutrients. What we feel is these two, especially the mushroom, can help dietary shortfalls in nutrients, such as uh, fiber, potassium, and magnesium. Mushrooms can be an excellent partner to encourage vegetable consumption because of their meat-like texture and also some of the components. You can partially remove replace meat with mushroom. Mushrooms have been found, especially the polysaccharides have, as a prebiotic, have been found to modulate gut microbiome. Now, gut microbiome is very important. That means the microbes that lives in our gut, especially the hindgut, 
is not only for the gut health, but for overall well-being. In fact, they say that how well we keep our gut healthy or how robust our gut is will affect other uh, physiological uh, components in our life, including our brain functions. And so the prebiotics, in this case, the polysaccharides are for the gut microbes. Now, if you look at the nutritional component of a valuable food, for example, like protein, it's the topmost. We all, it's a very important component of our diet. So a valuable food is one where a daily portion of about 100 to 150 grams will provide about 15% or more of the requirement of that essential substance then we consider it as a valuable food. Now, for example, if you take 100 grams of meat, steak, more than 30% of the daily protein requirement is covered. All right, so meat is valuable food for protein. So when we look at the dry weight basis, mushroom contain about 90 to 35% of protein. But when we look at rice, it has only about seven, around 7%, seven wheat about 13%, Highest, of course, in soya bean is close to 40 and milk 25. So the three popular mushrooms that are being globally produced in large scale, agaricus, bisporus, button, the shiitake, lentina, nula, edodus, and pleurotus, these three mushrooms have about 3 to 4% protein in their fresh weight, right? I should also have many of the essential amino acids and if you look at the three mushrooms there is no significant difference between the three they are about comparable amounts of these mushrooms this is represented as milligram per gram of fresh weight Beta-glucan is another important component, the polysaccharide. They are mainly immunomodulatory in function. And the beta-glucan is predominant in mushrooms with a small component of alpha-glucan, which comes mainly from plant-based like oats. Now, we found in our studies way back in 2013, that beta-glucan-rich extract from Pleurotus sagicajo, which is a grey oyster mushroom, in animal trials was shown to prevent obesity and oxidative stress on when those mice were fed on a high-fat diet. All right, this was published. And currently, we are carrying this forward with case studies, human case studies. Fatty acids... The saturated, low, only about 20% or less, 19 to 20%. Unsaturated is high. Again, the three mushrooms are comparable in their fatty acid profile. Sugars, mushrooms lack like starch. They contain mannitol. Mannitol has half the sweetness of cane sugar and is therefore regarded as sugar substitute for diabetics. In fact, according to Chang in 2008, said diabetics are allowed to eat about 200 grams of mushroom daily without taking it into consideration in their diet. So it will not contribute to a spike in sugar level. Potassium, a micro element, important. There are many. I only uh, have picked up a few just to highlight. Potassium, the regular in our diet, uh, daily diet, we need about 1,600 milligrams. And mainly this we get from vegetables, fruit, meat, and fish. But mushrooms are also rich in potassium. All right, you can get about 21 to 32% of the daily requirement. If we include about 100 to 150 grams of fresh mushroom. Here again, you see the button mushroom has a much higher value compared to oyster and Chitake, as far as potassium content is concerned. Mushrooms are also rich in vitamins. Now here I signaled out folic acid. 
we need about 0 0.2 milligrams. And this comes namely from animal source like liver or even spinach, fruit and yeast. <clears throat> Again, when we look at the mushroom, the oyster mushrooms fare well, whereas button and shiitake are comparable. So if we take about 100 to 150 grams of fresh mushroom, this should contribute to the potassium uh, folic acid level of about 38 to 58% required, the daily requirement. Mushrooms are a source of vitamin D. For adults, we need vitamin D uh, about five micrograms per day comes from mainly fish and meat. So if you're a vegetarian, you can also get it from, supposed to get it from your fruit and vegetable. But unfortunately, many, some of the vegetables that I've listed here, which we commonly eat, like carrot, tomatoes, or even fruits like apple, apricot, melon, there is zero uh, vitamin D, all right? Whereas in fresh mushroom, you can get high levels of vitamin D. And by consuming mushrooms, we can get about 36 to 67% of the mushroom of the daily requirement of our vitamin. Now, what we can do here is the white mushrooms, the fresh mushrooms are exposed to light, pulses of light, which converts the ergosterol, which is the sterol that is found in mushroom, to vitamin D2 or ergocalciferol. So if those of you who can't take uh, meat or take milk, and if you want your vitamin D, you can opt for mushroom. Right? This is sun dry or air dry, what I mentioned. Now, besides all these uh, components like proteins, vitamins, micro elements, uh, the polysaccharides, and the, and the carbohydrate content, we also have other nutritional components which can be considered in a valuable food. And these are found in mushrooms. This is the antioxidant source. Now, antioxidants are needed because we, we generate a lot of free radicals during our metabolic processes and also assault due to infection and other pollutants. So we need antioxidants to prevent damage to our cells. And antioxidant... Um, are needed to prevent this damage. Why? Because this damage leads to inflammation, and inflammation is triggers a lot of our illness or diseases. Now, what we found that antioxidant among the phenolic uh, components, but what we found now is the ergothionine is one of the most powerful antioxidant, and this is very common in fungi. Other microbes produce, but to a lesser degree, but fungi are the main producers of ergothionin. And mushrooms being fungi are a rich source of ergothionin. So how much should I eat mushrooms a day to get enough ergothionin to keep, my boat, uh, to keep uh, the oxidative uh, damage to a minimum? Professor Bielman, who comes from Pennsylvania University, says that we should aim for about three milligrams of ergothion, which is now being considered as a longevity vitamin a day. And where can we get this three milligrams? We can get it from oyster, shiitake, maitake, and even button. But if we take these three mushrooms, we only take about 25 grams of the mushroom. Whereas if you have to take button, you have to take four times more amount. So these three mushrooms are having higher levels of ergothionin. So this is a super high concentration of antioxidant. Ergothionin is the first one and also glutathionin. And based on the study together, these antioxidants, they protect the body from physiological stress that causes visible signs of aging. So we can think that to include mushrooms in your diet, and if you recall, a tracer study in Singapore did show that people who regularly consume uh, mushrooms, and they related that to the ergothion concentration in the system, can help uh, mitigate or reduce cognitive decline in the aging population. 
So this is a nice uh, article to read by Bielma, Nutrition Today. Micronutrients and bioactive compounds in mushrooms, a recipe for healthy aging. So we should consider this as part of our diet as we age. Now, of all the mushrooms that we talked to, uh, showed you earlier, the oyster mushroom and the shiitake mushroom, here I would like to concentrate on the oyster mushrooms for their health-related uh, activities because these mushrooms are not very uh, highly regarded or can be considered as neglected, and they are more used as vegetables. But what we found that they actually pack a lot of nutrients with functional attributes, such as for antioxidant, they have cytoprotective, genoprotective uh, properties, anti-diabetic insulin liquid. This is what we are looking at currently in our studies using uh, in uh, case studies of human trials. Right. And then we started this work way back in 2011 to show that it takes a long time to go from the initial lab scale right up to human trials. And we hope that this mushroom will be able to be used to mitigate um, obesity or even reduce impacts of diabetes. Now, oyster mushrooms, uh, I like to share two recent studies on the oyster mushrooms. They selected uh, edible medicinal mushroom from Pleurotus as an answer for human civilization diseases. This was published last year in Food Chemistry. They looked at the common <clears throat> oyster mushrooms, like the yellow oyster, the pink jamo, the king oyster, the white oyster, this is uh, also white oyster, and the pulmonary is the gray oyster. And they found that the biological active substances varied between the fruiting bodies or the mycelium. Mycelium is the thread like structure which can be grown in cultures, either as submerged cultures or on rice or wheat or any other grain. That is, you only get the mycelium. And then you can get the footing bodies if you allow them to go through that stage. And they found that there is a lot of differences. So what are the variations based on? The quality of oyster mushrooms is health and superfood, fruit bodies or mycelium. Variation based on... Uh, cultivation techniques, substrates used, cultivation techniques, processing techniques. All right. We find that fruiting bodies have high control uh, contents of phenolic components, whereas mycelia have other components. So it's very important that we cannot outright say mushrooms can do this or mushrooms have this and mushrooms have that. We have to be careful how they are grown, how they are processed. Another paper, also a recent paper, shows that cultivation techniques does affect the nutritional value of mushroom. So mushrooms are, can be easily uh, perishable because of their high water content. So they also can need to be preserved or to be cooked. So we also have to be very careful when we select our mushrooms that have been dried, the temperature of drying, all right, if they've been canned, how they have been produced, or how they have been the process of canning, all right. For all this will affect the functional components, including color, taste, uh, functional and nutritional values. So uh, preservation, one of them is pickling. Very little is known about pickling, lacto-fermentation. So this is uh, some initial studies have been done, but I think uh, this could be one way of enhancing and prolonging the goodness of the mushrooms via uh, lactic acid fermentation. So a lot of studies have to be done. Like for example, when we fry mushroom, deep fry mushroom or vacuum fry mushroom, are the mushrooms just as good? Yes, they're very nice, very tasty to eat, but are the functional attribute still remains after these functions, all right? So we have done a few studies and we found that customized cooking, 
steaming, blanching, etc., do affect the nutritional value of the mushroom. This was published in 2015, also again with pleurotus mushroom. Another mushroom which is very popular is the black jelly mushroom. Again, customized cooking can be used to enhance the value. But this mushroom has some uh, signature properties like thinning of blood, and these be retained by the processing method. So processing, cooking, we have to make sure that the functional properties of the mushroom are there when we are including it in the diet. For example, if the mushroom has not been dried, exposed to light, we cannot really say there is a lot of vitamin D in that mushroom. So where do mushrooms fit into our dietary advice? If we look at this, is the pyramid based on our Malaysian food pyramid. Mushrooms can be one, high protein because they have a good packed with protein. They also have high prebiotic component, which is good for our gut health. And also other functional molecules like antioxidant and also the phenolic components. So summarizing all the healthy aspects of eating mushroom, they are low in purine, all right? So people who have metabolic diseases like gout can still consume mushroom. Low glucose, more mannitol, suitable for diabetic. Low sodium, so if you have high blood pressure, uh, where you're asked to cut down salt component, you are safe with mushroom. Several vitamins, especially the B group of vitamins, which are very essential for our body. High content of minerals, these are mainly uh, many of our physiological reactions requires many of these, especially like potassium. And we also have a lot of trace elements from selenium. But what you have to remember is the way you grow the mushroom, the way you process the mushroom will dictate whether these things are present in the final product or not. All right. So enjoy your mushrooms. They come, you can do many things with them. You can make soup. You can make nuggets, you can pickle, this is tom yum, you can fry them. At the end of the day, uh, is taste against functionality. So if you're going for functionalities, you have to be very careful with your processing. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. I thank the management for having me to share <coughs> my slides and my my take on how mushrooms can be incorporated into our diet and how we can move towards including that as a regular component in our meals. Thank you, Dantri. <coughs> thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so much. Ma'am, uh Few questions are there, ma'am. Shall I continue? Yeah, I can continue and then I can take the questions later. Okay, ma'am. Shall I ask it, ma'am? Pardon? Shall I ask it? Ask the question, ma'am? Uh, is Dr. Jaya in? Yes, I mean. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> I think can. What you can do, you can type the questions in the chat box. I'll go through. And once Dr. Jaya has delivered, then we can. Uh, through the questions. Yeah. After the second session, finally we can uh, keep the question, question session, ma'am. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma <laughs> Dear participants, now it's time to move on to our second session. So to introduce our guest speaker for session session two, I request Dr. M. Sanjeev Kumar, Assistant Professor, Department of Microbiology, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, madam. I am very glad to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Jay Silan Satyasilan, sir, as a senior lecturer and researcher, Institute for Tropical Biology and Conversation, University of Malaya, Malaysia. He has completed his UG and PG degree at the University of Malaysia and PhD in molecular mycology and pathology at Clark University, Boston, USC. 
He has more than 15 years of both teaching and research experience in the field of mushroom biology. He has published more than 50 articles in peer-reviewed both national and international journals. He also published various books, book chapters and proceedings, etc. He served as principal investigator and he has successfully completed various funded projects in worth of 1.7 million. He has guided various UG, PG and doctoral students. He served in various positions like chief editor, coordinator, executive member in standard journals and reputable institutions, etc. He has participated and presented his research findings in various national and international conferences. He won numerous awards and rewards like Weirdly International Research Award, International Association for Plant Toxonomy Award, Excellence of Awards of Excellence issued by the University of Malaya, etc. These are about our chief guest, Dr. J. C. Lin, sir. Thank you, sir, being with us, sir. Thank you. Thank you once again. Over to you, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for the lovely introduction. Okay. Uh, how are you all? And uh, Vanakam. And good afternoon to all the participants who are participating today. Okay. It's a great honor that um, uh, today we are meeting in the International Webinar on Mushroom World. And uh, I'm very honored to and humbled to say thank you for giving uh, such an opportunity to share the research that we have been doing from the aspect um, from Malaysia or Southeast Asia as well, including in India, some of the counterparts that I have worked with. Okay, so as for the beginning, I would like to start with the introduction. So today's uh, topic, as I have uh, I've given to you all, uh, it's on mushroom poisoning. Since Prof. Vicky, my mentor, who she already uh, explain to you all the benefits and uh, advantage of these uh, cultivated mushrooms and also wild mushrooms for human consumption is one of the aspects. However, in my point of view, when you have an edible sources of mushrooms, and there are also some culprits that people always misidentify uh, them as an edible instead of poisoning. Okay, So, in this matter, what we are going to discuss here is on the poisoning aspects of the tropical species and the identification why is it so important for us or even for the medical doctors as well. So we have uh, done this uh, research and it's continuous research and we are cataloging a lot of uh, tropical mushrooms as well. Even in India you have uh, tons of uh, you know higher diversity of mushrooms where still a lot of uh, mushroom species are not identified fully. So in here, without further delay, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Jaya. You can call me Jaya or Silen. Okay. And uh, my topic would be mushroom poisoning in Malaysia, which is I'm stress on the accurate identification is a must. Why? Why it's a must? Because I'm going to explain to you why and also how. Okay, in the picture, as you can see, you may or may not understand about the tropical versus temperate species. And people have been using most of the, you know, non-mycologists or people who are beginners, okay? They're referring to all the European names for the tropical species. So, that's why I'm here to explain to you all. They are totally different. And some of them, yes, it's a pantropical distribution but most of them are not. So the tropical species here, which I'm going to talk about, includes all the Southeast Asian distribution. Okay, my talk, uh, the outline of my talk is as an introduction to the mushroom poisoning. What are the problems and challenges uh, that we are facing here? And uh, also the identification techniques and species information uh, that involved within this study. And I'm going to talk about also some case studies that happened in Borneo, Malaysia, 
in instead of um, uh, detail about the medical uh, information, I'm going to talk about the species information and where does this occur and when does this occur. And also the awareness uh, to the uh, to the public and the medical doctors and the, also the health inspectors, how we are interrelated with our work from the science aspects and then to disseminate the knowledge to others. And also some of the collaborative efforts and mitigation that has been taken from this project and also to share what are the collaborate, uh, collaboration that we can do together in the future and some of the take home messages as well. So when you talk about mushroom poisoning, okay, when you talk about mushroom poisoning, it's the between a collaboration where the mycologists collaborate with the chemist, toxicologists, or even the medical officers. Because it's a very interesting thing because the earlier the records of the medical cases, mushroom poisoning, was not focused or emphasized on the species information, but the symptoms and the onset reactions to the patients and the patient's information, how the drugs is given, based on what, so for the categories that involve in here, which I will talk about later, where these are the things that medical officers always do. But without the species identification or cataloging all these poisonous mushrooms, it's a very difficult status where we face that since in 2010 till now. So what we did, we collaborate with the mycologists as well, the chemists and the toxicologists, and also with the medical officers and health inspectors. And most of the uh, mushroom that I'm going to talk about here is the Bacillomyces group, which are naked eye, you can see everywhere or anywhere in your field or even backyard of your house. And everything and the fleshy mushroom is always with the gill sometimes there are mushrooms with the paws which are called the bracket fungi where these are the two entities that i'm going to talk about here and mostly we are focusing on the fleshy mushrooms because every time when people see that oh that's very delicious to eat that's the concept right so we are going to look into that and uh, is it one species that occur in our nation where this is happening like you know uh, many cases or what so is there multiple species involved or not so these are the questions that we have to ask when it comes to the mushroom poisoning so here is an overview of the poisonous mushroom incidences that occurred from 1990 to 2019 we compiled all these systematic reviews and the papers all together and the bubble map shows that how many the cases that have been evolved. So the size of the bubble bigger, that means the more papers are from those regions. So in North America or the Europe, or even some parts of Asia and China and Japan, they have uh, categorized a lot of species, especially from the Amanita species group. Okay, however, in the tropical system, in here in the Southeast Asia and including India as well, where we do not have any kind of information, the thorough information to refer to. So what we are going to do is, and also they are lacking of uh, sequences in the gene bank deposition, where uh, I'm talking about, about Borneo, the Malaysian Borneo part, where we have recorded about 134 cases all this while, and then there is no cataloging of uh, these poisonous mushrooms. So now is the time for us to I know, collaborate with all the medical doctors. So we have started this with uh, Dr. Maria, where she was one of the CDC um, person, uh, infectious disease and also the mushroom poisoning uh, interest. She was very interested and then she, we collaborated and we uh, compiled all this information together with the uh, health inspectors and medical officers. And here are some of the species that you can see, the, like the entheloma, the chlorophyllum, my molybdides, Trogia, Cotinarius, or these are all available in Southeast Asia. However, the most common for Peninsular Malaysia is the chlorophyllum molybdides. However, in the hotspot biodiversity area like Borneo, we have tons of uh, different types of species that are available here. Okay, any questions so far? All clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, at least I get to know that there are some audiences because it's so quiet. Eh? Okay, so now we move on to the next slide where when you talk about uh, temperate 
fungi. Okay, temporary fungi or mushrooms. Okay, uh, I ha- I saw the this one um, doctor or professor asked about the you know fungi or the mushroom. Uh, actually, fungi is a kingdom uh, which it comprises. Mushroom is one of the part of that. Okay, so mushroom is the uh, fruit body that arises like you know as a kind of from mycelium and then to fruit body. So it's one of the pen element within the fungi. Fungi is a general term. Okay, I hope I answered that question. And uh, here, what are the top mushrooms that you can talk about? Mushroom poisoning. I mean, these are the things that you will refer to any papers in the website or even in the social media where these are the tons of uh, papers have been available. All, out of all these, Amanita was the most highest cited papers uh, in every aspects on mushroom poisoning because they have these amatotoxins which are the deadly poisonous. So people are coming up with a lot of cataloging like any species and also the gyrometrin. These are the species as very rare or even no distribution in Southeast Asia. But we have other types of species with the tropical ones, especially here. The poison fire coral recently, like a few years or three years back, was a big uh, issue where when the Japanese were found that these mushrooms are actually uh, causing a lot of poisonous when people mistakenly eat them. So this uh, photostroma that we have in Southeast Asia, especially in Borneo, we have recorded. Even in Singapore, we have recorded. So these information are very, very sporadic. So how we gather these information and to collaborate with every scientist and the mycologist and the medical doctors within the region to document these as a catalog. So that's my purpose and also uh, my mentor, Prof. Vicky's uh, purpose as well. So we started this in 2016 and then it's moved on. Okay. So as a background, what are the problems and the challenges that we face? Definitely, because when we have a, such a higher number of cases in a rural remote access areas, some report, uh, some has been reported cases. However, in remote access, there is no reported cases in the hospital record. So these are the things that, you know, will be very uh, difficult for us to, because the disparity of the information on these mushrooms and uh, which are the causing the poisonous one, no, nobody knows about it. So we have to compile this in a very systematic way. So what we do, we do a DNA barcoding, for example, out of all the reported cases, could we get the specimens and then we do a barcoding. So the challenges here, we have DNA sequences are very lacking in, in deposition. Okay, and especially the common, most common mushroom like uh, chlorophyllum molybdite, it's been, and amanita has been well uh, established. So what are the toxins involved within these species have been uh, recorded in many publications. However, the tropical species still are unknown. So that's why we have to initiate this effort to characterize all these uh, toxins and the efficacy of the toxic to human bo- uh, body and, and so on. And what are the symptoms? You see, when you talk about mushroom poisoning, you have several symptoms like renal failure, liver failure, and also gastrointestinal irritants and stuff like that. It's a lot of categories that has been de- uh, described by medical officers. So. In this case, we are not going to on the medical aspects because we are not the medical experts. So the experts. So we always refer these species as what are the species and what are the symptoms. Okay, the common symptoms is nausea and vomiting and diarrhea, but there are some different species causing a different reaction. Even when you eat a shiitake or a common uh, oyster mushroom, people tend to get uh, dermatitis where like the schizophilum, it's an edible mushroom, but it depends on the reactivity of uh, the, uh, the individual. I mean, several, I mean, different individuals, they have different uh, reactions. And also the toxicology studies are lacking in mushroom poison as well. So why we, uh, we got interested in the mushroom poisoning? Because when you look back the early history, Okay, there was a first documented report on the mushroom poisoning was in 1980, where a group of soldiers, they consumed the mushroom poisoning and they 
uh, they died. You know, the, uh, they died because of the consumption. So we have no record what is the mushroom there. Actually, they just say it's a mushroom poison, uh, poisonous mushroom. That's it. So those are the things that we need to dig up all this information and then use all this information for scientific research and to disseminate the knowledge in uh, to the public. So here is just an example of some of the published records that has been available in Malaysia. And sometimes when I get specimens from clinical uh, cases, they will send a vomit sample, which is very difficult to identify them because sometimes the DNA, uh, it's too difficult for us to extract the DNA. So we need to have the real sample. So what we can do, okay, we plan, okay? That means we train the, uh, the medical officers and the health inspectors for collection and curation of the sample before they come and give it to us in the lab. So what are the things that we are lacking? It's a summary where a proper catalog of mushroom is not available for tropical species. We can see a lot of um, European names from many different countries in Europe, and North America, and Australia, everything. But what about our Asia or the Southeast Asian mushrooms, the tropical ones? We do not have a proper catalog. So these are the uh, uh, lacking, the, what do you call this? These are the lacking elements we need to address in our research. So the lack of collaboration. So the disparity uh, of these information must be gathered between the medical officers and also the researchers. And these are always collective information is based on case studies, which are the medical aspects. But they neglected the mushroom information. So we are the one who are going to give you the information on the mushroom and the medical doctors giving you the treatments. So that's a simple collaboration here. And uh, intensive sampling is needed because several remote areas you need to access every part of the you know Bornean Island and also the other part of uh, Malaysian Borneo is the Sarawak. It's another remote area where still people are living in a very remote area without the road access. And then a uh, lot of sample preparation techniques. It uh, depends on the, the humidity and also the seasonal that you are collecting. During the rainy season, it's very dry, I mean, very difficult to dry them. So what we can do, all these other lacking parts that we have to address. So we initiated um, a big uh, project on this uh, where it's a uh, we want to do all the DNA barcoding. So everything, like as you can see from here, the divisions and the locations has to be two different seasons because we do have only two seasons. So these are the factors, the ecological factors that can affect the distribution of the mushroom. And also what are the kind of uh, fruiting season? What are the div uh, divisions and the habitats? And also, is there any mimicry involved? So these are the things, because you know why? Many people, they have misidentified the Termitomyces group, which is uh, shown here in the big picture here, okay, instead of uh, Entheloma as well, because we have found that uh, the chlorophyllum molybdates also see uh, resemblance to the Termitomyces clepiatos. So these are the things, information we need to address and fill in the gap. And the use of methods that we are addressing in our lab is all the ecological characters and the ecological methods, and also multigen phylogeny is the main uh, interest that uh, I am interested to identify the species based on morphological species concept and the phylogenetic species concept. And then we add on to the toxin analysis using the standard solutions that are already available, and also what are the toxins that the Bodin mushrooms or the Malaysian mushrooms have. So we need to know. So when you talk about the in vitro toxicity, we need to know those mushrooms are affecting which are the group, belongs to which are the group, psychotoxicity, neurotoxicity, or mycotoxic. Mainly like um, aspergillus, like the microfungi, they can, can, they can cause uh, mycotoxin. So you know that there are a categorization of this type of poisoning. So mushrooms falls under which? So which are the mushroom falls in which category? Very important. So what species of mushroom goes into these groups? Then we have to give an impact to the society because with all these scientific evidences, how do we help the community? So we engage with the medical doctors, medical practitioners, where we uh, supply the information 
in a very a systematic way. And also, when they are giving us samples, we need to give a record of that samples, and then we identify them in based on the record, and then we provide those information that needed. And then you have lots of uh, novel species involved whenever you go for these kind of uh, field trips, expeditions, and you still you will find a lot of new species for tropical, especially in India, like country like India, Malaysia. We are like the you know the the, the gold mine of all these mushroom diversity here. Okay, as a summary of these um, uh, slides, where these are the lab protocols and uh, the standard, uh, the way of uh, doing our work, where the sample collections until the drying, and then you have all these DNA methods. Okay, this one, my friend Dufesa, where I took from his paper, where the standard protocols that you need to involve with this uh, phylogeny and then the alignments and all, then you will have a beautiful phylogenetic tree to say that, you know, it's a very uh, concrete evidence to say that with the morphological characters and the phylogenetic relationship, you may tell the stories and where does this species stands on, okay? And also the methods for identifying uh, the screening, we can do LCMS uh, spectra analysis where several uh, standard solution, we can detect the major compounds as well. But in this study, we will see only uh, two examples where I'm going to talk about. Okay, not only that, we do also uh, species distribution modeling with the help of uh, my friend Faisal and uh, Julius, where we record all these uh, GPS locations and also the current and the old data, and then we produce these mappings based on the max and uh, modeling, where this will tell us where does this uh, sample bias, where does this sample distributed. So these are the kind of information that we have to produce from these uh, uh, mushroom poisoning cases. Where does this occur? Where does this hotspot for that particular species we need to know? Okay, so this one, uh, very general information on the kidney damaging orelanin, which are belongs to the cotinaria species. So cotinarius is high diversity in, in tropical, but none of uh, cotinarius has been reported as poisoning so far in the, you know, in Malaysia as well, where this one, when you look into it, it's quite colorful, of course. The perception of the local people here, when it's colorful, they are, they don't dare to eat because they say it may, uh, you know, contain a poisonous uh, compounds. So those are the things that myths and uh, stories that pass down from their families, like, you know, traditionally, it's also helped them to, you know, be aware with the colors, okay, with the color mushrooms, you don't dare to eat them, okay? So that's another aspect that I've uh, given to you, one of the uh, cases. And then you have the recent one, like 2012, when I was reading this uh, mushroom, I mean, about Trogia, it was there for a long time, but we didn't know that this pilerotoid shaped mushroom is a Trogia, because they look like a oyster mushroom when it's wet or when it's in the field, they look like, uh, you know, pilerotoid shape. So this, co uh, co uh, this causes hundreds of deaths in southwestern China. So it may happen to in our district as well. So we have to always up to date with all the species information where this is a called a, as a little white mushrooms and then they contain two new non-protein amino acids. So it, when it involves pe peptide stuff, they tend to have very, uh, you know, they can cause death uh, to anyone. And also the edible mushrooms like macrolipiota. There are edible macrolipiota, but there are also a macrolipiota that resembles like, you know, chlorophyllum molybdite as well. They contain this one of the compound called the macrolipiotin, which is the endoalkaloid. It's an alkaloid base where it causes the serious apathetic, apathetic toxicity. So there is, it's poisonous to your liver, you know? So, and I have not seen this uh, very rare to, you know, to be reported in Asia, but this was reported in uh, 19, uh, 2009, where they say that this is a poisonous one, okay? And then 
my neighboring country where uh, Thailand has also reported uh, some of the few examples. So we can refer to the Southeast Asian mean, uh, okay, we can say that, you know, they, they may look like with our distributor because Southeast Asia uh, and tropical uh, mushrooms, sometimes they matches with different, uh, you know, matches very, phylogenetically they matches very uh, similar. So here, this is one of the coprine, where the coprine is actually a gastrointestinal GI mushroom. So it's a syndrome that happened in Thailand as well. So what about um, Saba, the Borneo, where the number of cases increase? Okay, this is uh, provided by the JKNS, where the Saba State Health Department, where we have all these incidents, the number of poisoning reported in Saba from 2001 and 2016. From the time that you can see from here, okay, whenever there's no data, that means it's good. Am I right? Because you don't get poisoned and die here. Am I right? So, what we do here, there is a spike over here. So, why is that? What is why this uh, higher cases has been reported here and here? So, th those are the things that we have to understand why the cases are arising. Whenever there's a rainy season, this is common, very common. But the number of species that they are eating is so diverse. So many different groups of fungi. I mean, eat uh, chlorophyllum or even other fungus as well. So the cases in Samba, when we combine the 2001 till 2017, which uh, I have proposed this as the, you know, the hotspot, the area based on our data here. These are the map, uh, the map of Saba where the southern part and then, you know, Tambunan is a very cold area, always humid and uh, very uh, suitable for mushroom growth uh, because it has a very nice temperature, okay? So these are the things that, you know, we have to gather all this information for the mushroom poisoning cases or the mushroom poisoning outbreaks. And then, uh, Dr. Maria and uh, Maria Suleiman and uh, also Dr. Kat, uh, Michael, uh, sorry, Dr. Mikal, where they have come up with this guideline on the management of mushroom poisoning for the Saba State Health Department. So, it was very great and honor that our our contribution could give uh, them the you know how to manage the mushroom poisoning cases. So, these are the things that they have uh, you know the medical parts has been contributed as well. And then, when you talk about uh, the mushrooms, right, you have so many mushrooms there out there. And then, we don't know whether it's forest to table or forest to hospital. So, you end up in hospital mean, that means poisoning. So, if you end up in nothing happened to you, that means you enjoy the mushroom feast. Okay, we do have, like, you know, a lot of uh, wild cultivars and uh, wild edible mushrooms. But the thing is, here, we do not know which one is totally edible or is it totally poisonous? We don't know. So one of the tricks that I have conducted when I was uh, traveling and uh, the locals do mix up with the edible and the poisonous mushroom in their bag. So that was a kind of a significant kind of, uh, you know, observation that I find it you shouldn't, uh, you know, mix up with the edible and poisonous. So that means they are lacking of those information. So we need to educate them. So how is that possible? for the common people that they collect and then they're selling for their own income. So how do we stop that kind of things? So these are the things, gathering of information is like, you know, it took five years for me to, you know, get it done in a, in a self-solid way. Okay, and then some um, mushrooms, that uh, wild mushrooms, we cultivate in the lab. So the, the, the interest of the cultivars is depend on the student. So we... We, we, we try to cultivate uh, Pilaratus gigantius and even uh, from Wiki also, we all were doing on the PG, uh, PG we call the gigantius uh, and the tuberagium as well. Because these are the oysters, that diametic oysters. They are not like monomitic, huh? Okay. And then we have also local delicacies that people use uh, wild mushrooms for consumptions, like, you know, in the festival kind of, uh, of uh, a special occasion. They cook all these kind of uh, food, with including the wild mushrooms as well. And then these are the, some of the, you know, edible or non-edible mushrooms that can be grown in the lab as well. So these are the kind of, uh, you know, experiment that we always want to, uh, you know, look into that, you know, how's the growth, 
what, what kind of uh, behavior, I mean, the growth characteristic, how do they grow? These are all under the observation. And then you come up with a, a good poster, suppliers for the public to educate them what are the local names and what are the scientific names. And then this will make, uh, make sure that the information is uh, passed down to many people so that they are aware of all the edible or non-poisonous mushrooms. So, what are the species that always mistakenly eaten by the community? So, these are the species, as I say, the chlorophyll of molybdides, amenitaphyloid, and then the trogia, the two types of trogia, the infundibulibus and also venenata. These are the things that always people will think, uh, you know, trogia is, looks like pleurotus oyster, so we can eat it now. Okay? So, you must be very careful. Some amenitas, yes, yeah, you can eat. But some you cannot eat. But we need to know and verify the identification of the species. And here, the edible groups. Of course, India as well, uh, you have a lot of diverse uh, uh, termitomyces, uh, different species. And I really like, uh, you know, the diverse uh, group of termitomyces in Nepal and India. But I'm not sure with, the, you know, the whole Indian distribution on these uh, species, actually. But they are delicious. They, well, they are called as termite mushrooms, and in Malaysia, they call the town, uh, Chedawan town, or Chedawan Buso, that means it's a termite mushroom. Huh? And then, recently also, there's another type of looking like the termitomyces hymi in particular, where it it's not a termitomyces, it was a entheloma. When we received the sample, we got uh, really interested because uh, it was not an eh? Termitomyces. I thought it was a termitomyces because they look same, same as the, you know, the cap is, uh, and then the gill was uh, pink. So everything matches with like the termitomyces. But here, these are not termitomyces. There's the entoloma and they are poisonous. So we shouldn't eat them. And then some of the amenitas that are available uh, as an edible sources, which, but most of the people here in Malaysia, I mean, uh, amenita. They only go for the, the one like here, this one, the what do you call this, uh, Malayansis. They, they, they eat uh, the Malayansis and similis actually, but when they are young only, but they, the cooking style and everything, they heat up or they make a soup or they make a, you know, you know some, uh, some kind of a paste, stuff like that. However, within them, okay, as you can see from this paper, Tang et al. published this paper for the Malaysian Amanitas, where they all look the same, am I right? Because they all look the same color, but just slightly different. But the red one here, the culprit is Amanita princeps, are very, very dangerous. They are equivalent to the Amanita phylloid as the US and the Americas uh, distributed, the poisonous mushroom, okay? And then in 2019, there was a lot of, uh, you know, it was an interesting call Oh, there was uh, 18 cases reported in, in one particular area they called the Pata Marudu. Okay, then at the same time I was uh, there on an expedition in that area. Then we were finding lots of this pink color, uh, beautiful uh, entheloma in every region. And you know what? They grow on the termite mushroom, I mean the termite uh, mound. So people assumed that this was termitomyces. So that was very, very interesting for me when that uh, outbreak was uh, occurred on that time and that particular time in during the rainy seasons because these are not termitomyces, they are entheloma. So that was the first record actually uh, that happened in Sabah actually. And then we further the characterization, we matched with all the gene banks and then we generated the sequence and we matched and then biogeographically they are separating. Yeah, the Chinese with a Bornean, but we uh, name this as a, you know, Antolopo Masculium as well because their morphological characters matches exactly with the Chinese mat uh, material. But the Chinese material in China, they have never reported this as a mushroom poisoning. So we are lucky that it happened in Sabah and then we highlighted this as a very important mushroom. And then we analyzed the uh, some of the in the LCMS analysis on the neurotoxic compound because entheloma tend to have 
a lot of neurotoxic compounds. So the compounds that we have uh, identified based on our collaboration with Dr. Mao, Dr. Uh, Mao Shah, where he has analyzed the hydroxy tryptophan, and then he found that there are some phenylalanine and also pilocarpine, which it's also found in the European distributed Entoloma sinuatum, Entoloma rhodophyllum in Japan, especially also they have these species. But in Entoloma mastoideum, is only what's reported in uh, China so far, okay, based on the records that we have. And then what happens, you know, with all these scientific information, the underground, you know, the, all these uh, fundamental information, we generate these into a public and uh, collaboration with the state, Sabah State Health Department on mushroom. We produce all the details information when they receive and the samples are received within two weeks we give them the results and then we report all these uh, types of whatever the things that the species information we match with all these type of toxins that are available so these are the kind of works that we have done and we have completed for the five years great collaboration and uh, we come up with all these uh, within the five years we know that there are dangerous and poisonous mushrooms, and also there are edible species. But out of these uh, records over here, it's just a, like you know, it's just a one third of uh, the whole uh, system, the hot spot, like a country like hotspot biodiversity, because the red ones are the most common ones. Now we have included trogia and Anthroma as well, but these three, the superiorus cybele, cybella, and porridges, and then amanita chlorophyllum, were the most common thing. But as the data goes on, now you know that Trogia and Entoloma is also available in uh, the tropical and it's causing a lot of poisonous cases as well. So we have to uh, be aware with all this information for our country where we need to save the people from eating all these uh, poisonous mushrooms. And then sometimes some people, they also have uh, this um, speculation where the uh, bioluminescent mushroom is edible or uh, poisonous. Uh, for me, they look like pleurotoid. Previously, this was all under pleurotoid groups, okay? But now we know that based on the identification, accurate identification, we know that these are not edible, okay? So please, they are beautiful in the field, but they are not edible. And then we created with a collaboration between Sabah State Department, uh, State, State Health, and we created the Mushroom E Emergency in 2018, where we uh, invite all these, uh, you know, it's a, like a kind of a very big uh, celebration. Uh, and also for the identification and also workshops and training will be provided. So we started this in 2018 and then we collaborated with UM and UM Care and Mushroom Center for all of these. We gathered all the mycologies and then we execute this to all the educational so these are the things that we wanted to be, you know, spreading all this good information. Now we don't see that much of cases, which is very good to know that. And also we have to create a public awareness. So when mushroom poisoning, yes, definitely you need to, you know, spread it out, like, you know, in a forms of writing and also paper articles and magazines and stuff like that. So we came up with all these uh, you know, and then Dr. Maha is our, you know, Petri Dish, uh, you know, a writer where we have given all these uh, UM as highlighted the chlorophyllum incidences, uh, I mean, the peninsula. And what are the outreach programs that we can do? And then, you, of course, you have to, you know, uh, use uh, some of the, you know, funding to educate these kids where sometimes these kids, uh, they have a lot of good eyes because in the field, they can spot a lot of species different. So we make it as a community project, like, you know, citizen science, where they can collect the mushrooms and then they send to us. And then we do a lot of identification and we keep for scientific purposes. And also we give a lot of information on the, uh, the, the species level information for the public actually. And then what you can get from these uh, diverse mushrooms that you have, of course, we have to produce a lot of um, uh, inputs so on scientific monographs and also field book, coffee tables. A simple coffee table should be enough because 
these are the things that you see every day. You're taking photos and then you compile everything. And then what, what are you going to do? Uh, so be creative and innovative. Where In my class, I always uh, design the course where the students have to explore the kind of innovative things where they can come up with a lot of uh, fun stories and children's books and also uh, the mushrooms recipes for the local usage and the local cuisines where we highlight them at all and then we disseminate this information in the publication form. So that's all about my research on the mushroom poisoning aspects where a lot of cases and a lot of uh, you know uh, efforts and collaboration between uh, among us and then I'm going to talk about a little bit on a uh, time manner. Uh, is it okay for you all? Hello? Yes sir, yes sir, you can continue. Okay, so these are very few slides. You may collaborate with us, so it's like, you know, it's an ongoing project which are, some are completed, some are, we are extending towards another level. So these are the things that we have. We have shared this common interest where lignosis is available in India, but uh, there is no, like, you know, uh, proper survey, or proper, uh, you know, species information and also collections are based, uh, not available. So if you guys are really interested, we can work on these medicinal mushroom, which are, this mushroom has been established in Malaysia, actually. Very, very, very unique uh, species. But now we know that with the species concept, we now can say that we have quite a number of species in, you know, available in Malaysia because Malaysia already uh, described three species by Dr. Tan. But the thing is, we are getting more. We are getting more and more other species as well. So this is something good news for us where people can collaborate. People can collaborate on extending the uh, number of samples. And, you know, the more samples, the better the result is actually. And then you have also species complex because every time when you see a lot of synonyms, every time when you have a new species, I don't dare to publish a lot of new species. Just, just like you know, oh, this is new species. No, you must have a because my supervisor or my advisor, Professor David, even has told me that you know when you want to really make sure that you are publishing a new species, you need to go through, go dig and you know dig up all this information and then you publish them. So when you dig up all this information, we can see how ma how much of mess that, you know, these uh, names of the lignosis has been, uh, you know, recorded here. So we have to work out these particular groups, you know. So these are the things that, you know, uh, I love to do. And uh, BioD is our strength, you know. We cannot leave out the BioD because even though we are, you know, mycologists, we have to diversify this, uh, this concepts of, you know, mushroom poisoning mean mushroom poisoning, no. It, you have to explore, explore, read more further, and then we can share all these in a scientific, uh, you know, uh, scientific rewards for us. And then uh, number two is also another project with uh, my friend Tom, uh, who's in uh, uh, Czech Republic, and also my student PhD, um, Maria Lee. She's working on the biocontrol agents from the entomopathogenic fungi. It's one of the a new project that we have been initiated and also with UNIMAS, Dr. Faisal. And uh, we have uh, collected some of the uh, very, you know, the global focus of this EF fungi because EF fungi is published by a lot of uh, new species from Thailand, you know, Brazil. But what about Borneo? Because Borneo doesn't have any information apart from the Ophiocordyceps uh, unilateralis. Okay, so then. I started and initiated with my students where they worked and uh, some of the very interesting uh, data that you can see from each of the insect groups where which are the insect groups that you can find all these uh, fungus you know whether it's animal or whether it's a telemorph you just collect and you curate and then you did uh, all these uh, you know phylogenetic work to describe the evolutionary relationship and then some of the very cool system also, the you see, the entomopathogenic fungi has been, uh, you know, <clears throat> diverse actually in Borneo. Because I thought it was going to be only one or two species, but they are different, different groups over here. So 
these are the things that we could expand and also we can talk about research when, uh, when we publish it in the sense of Southeast Asia or Asia. That would be great actually. So I welcome any one of you all uh, you know, interested to work with us you know, on this group. And then the most uh, problematic groups, uh, the wild pleurotus, okay. It used to be a very, very problematic group where the chronology, as you can read later, where this is a chronology where in Borneo, Corner was the best uh, British mycologist that has been described a lot of species. And uh, from there onwards, we have studied these groups actually. And then we found that monomatic IFA and the dimetic IFA separation. So that means we do have two types of uh, Eiffel system over here in the, within the failure of the So I focused on um, the uh, tuberagium, but my student Fu uh, was em emphasizing in the diametic species in the Gigantia. So we have resolved some of these clades and uh, problematic clades. So when we do a lot of uh, morphological character mapping, we need to make sure that the validity of the species information is very important in terms of morphology or even phylogeny. So we have created a, a very comprehensive for, for this uh, tuberagium. As you can see from here, the tuberagium, everybody was, uh, you know, uh, speculated that, you know, the sclerotia can be found in our Asian specimens. And, uh, as you can see here, the Asian specimen doesn't have the sclerotia, I mean the sclerotia, I mean the tuber. Okay, the only thing is the African plate, they have all the, but these are red, the orange one, India, China, these are all, we need to trace back the specimen or are they commercial strain from the Africa, which is the origin. So we need to, you know, solve all this kind of information, you know, when it comes to the species accurate identification. Okay, and then number four, I mean, not number four, and then we able to study them. So what we did, of course, it's a saprophytic fungi. So we we tried a several methods and we developed uh, this uh, soil casing method to you know grow the grow when they are growing. You know the morphological characters development. So that is something that we can support. That when it's growing, there is no sclerotia. So it's obvious that this was not uh, actually a sclerotia a tuber producing tuberagium. And then, of course, a lot of uh, uh, temperate forests, they have covered um, cantarellas, some parts of uh, tropical as well, cantarellas. But I have worked on this cantarellas work with Korean scientists, where Professor Yang Yiwon Lim. And uh, we also, we came up with a lot of, uh, you know, new species within the cantarellas for Borneo. So these are all the contribution that we are giving to the society, you know, what, what are the new species, novel species are discovering, you know, things like that. So the evolutionary relationship between the tropical species and the temperate species are quite different. And then we still, uh, people still using the temperate names, I mean, the European names. So we have to have our own names for all the species uh, of mushrooms. And then the project five is actually, I would love to have uh, the Indian continent uh, panus uh, or Lanthinus uh, species, where I think uh, it's one of the company because I think one of the Indian researcher from Kerala, he sent me uh, the, the sequences of uh, some of the materials when I was doing my PhD. So I continued this research on the worldwide distribution piece. So this is uh, like, you know, it can be, uh, you know, extend for more other countries as well. So these are the things that we are generating and we are, you know, addressing the the, the problematic groups in, within the mushroom. Okay, Panos is a really interesting group, but it's a lot of mess over there. But as you can see from here, the blue one is all the blue and the green one is all the newly generated uh, sequences, except for the black one is from the gene bank. That means you can see how many sequences that we have de developed within this, uh, uh, this one particular gene. And you can see there's a lot of different species, uh, you know, segregate uh, in, in terms of uh, morphology and phylogeny. Because all these was basically a lot of synonyms, a lot of synonyms. And uh, most of the problematic is new species by morphology only. Now, 
need a lot of molecular data support that and then you thorough, thoroughly you have to sample or data mining within the gene bank deposit sequences and then you confirm where are the new species and then there's another uh, last one okay the fungal diversity of the caves okay you might be asking that only mushrooms or no actually i love uh, because my, i started with the uh, aspergillus so my interest was only on the aspermycin so we extend this actually into a uh, uh, into the uh, microfungal on the limestone or cast information actually the limestone research was triggered for me when i was undergraduate uh, i read a paper from india actually so it was from india then i got the idea of developing this actually in the limestone caves and we have successfully you know uh, we have uh, finished this project and we are continuing to the next level on the metagenome aspect so with this i would like to um, congratulate and also uh, thank you to all my collaborators and uh, the networking mushroom networking has been expanded since 2015 till now with, uh, tremendously and uh, of course i have to thank uh, my mentor prof vicky and also prof david for the interest and the passion that they have given me and you know and also the for me also i need some motivation right so of course we have to motivate our ourselves to to explore more and uh, more stories to tell the people and these are my lab members who have uh, graduated and then uh, still uh, working on it and then uh, uh, three new uh, candidates as well so without them this wouldn't be possible for me okay and uh, of course i would like to say always uh, if uh, given the opportunity we always create a community so that's all about you know the talk and thank you so much for listening and i hope i didn't bore you okay that's all for me thank you sir thank you for your wonderful presentation sir shall we move on to the question session sir yes please so one question from priya prasannan how to identify the poisonous and non poisonous mushroom from the field <laughs> i i expected that question actually but, but but it's a very interesting question according to the you know in according to the the written information in uh, publication and everything you must have the annulus or the ring okay if you have the annulus that means it's a poison no actually there is no definite character to differentiate between the poisonous or edible mushrooms i mean to my knowledge i would say that based on your experience working with the specimens then you may tell the differences but please do not assume whenever there's a ring or whenever there's a insects on the mushroom you can eat you know those myth myths are all you cannot believe that because sometimes these insects they are hopping into the mushrooms because they want to spread the spore it's a you know agent dispersal agent so it's something to do with ecology but not necessary that if they are sitting on the mushroom uh, then you can eat so that means uh, in in conclusion what i'm trying to say here there is no definitive uh, definite character to differentiate them. so your question next question sir yeah, please as mentioned there are mushrooms which are poisonous that look alike their edible counterparts are there rapid test kits that can help the locals to identify and differentiate the mushrooms apart okay so you mean um, you have uh, the kit okay now uh, there's a one kit that available in the market where they call the amatotoxin uh, toxin actually so you can uh test on that but we are not sure that it will be valid for each of the time when you are in the field it may change but the detection kits are all it depends on the species in uh, that available in the field thank you sir one more question sir if we try to cultivate few edible mushrooms at home then what precaution should be taken for preventing the contamination of them <laughs> cultivation part 
Okay, I pass this to Prof. Vicky. Prof. Vicky, can you answer that? Sure, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, try to cultivate few edible mushrooms at home and what precautions should be taken for preventing contamination? Um, it depends on your where you're getting these uh, mushroom substrates and inoculation and all have been done. Is it, are you buying the kits or you're preparing everything on your own? Libita, are you still there? Can you, um, because if you are doing on your own, there are many levels that you can face contamination. Right, and uh, if you buy kits, uh, that means they're already inoculated, ready. You just uh, bring them home, and during the spawn run, you keep them in a, not uh, in a dark place, depending on the temperature that is required. And once they're ready for fruiting, that means you, the conditions must be suitable for fruiting. That means there must be enough moisture. Temperature might be, have to be lowered. All right. And it has to be clean. The environment has to be clean. I think if the person who asked the question, if you can elaborate a bit or give an example. Some uh, gastromycetes puffball, stink horns, young egg stage edible, but mature stage not edible. What is the reason that any chemical changes in maturing stage? Okay, uh, that one I think, uh, yes, I have read some papers uh, regarding on the maturation ages, you know, that uh, the mushroom that has different chemical metabolites. So, it is possible actually when you have a younger stage and the older stage and you, the chemical may be different. So, I mean, I didn't check, I mean, I, didn't, I don't do that on that particular research. Maybe the chemists uh, definitely would love, I mean, they would you know, able to answer that, actually. Thank you, sir. Please tell some, please tell the some mushrooms which can be used as tonics. <laughs> ah, the, the mushrooms, okay, like for example, the Ophiocordyceps, okay, the one uh, you saw, the zombie fungi, okay. So, those are, um, has been uh, in Tibet and India, actually, Nepal has a very, um, a lot of uh, markets for that, actually, the Ophiocordyceps militaris, where it is used as a tonic. So, uh, you may refer that species as a, but we do not know other species like militaris or Cordyceps, uh, and then also there's another one species that they have recently added to that as a tonic as well. So. There are mushrooms that are used as a tonic as well. Thank you, sir. Any more questions? Dear participants, any, is there any other questions? Do not have any questions. That's amazing. Uh, sir. Yep. Okay. Uh, in Malaysia, this is the this there will be a mushroom they sell. Not mushroom, it's a serbu kayu or something, sir. They sell in the plastic bag. Can we do it at home ourselves, sir? The cult, the what is that? Uh? The are you the medium, the medium to grow the mushroom in the plastic bag. Can we do it ourselves here, sir? Actually, you can actually because uh, the saprophytic type of mushroom, right, is easy to grow on any kind of woods because they need carbons from the wood, right? So degradation is occurring there. So a lot of cellulase enzymes, lignin enzymes. So they need all these enzymes for their growth. So any types of wood is possible, but usually people use a soda. So now they are transforming the sodas into other aspects as well. But whatever the types of wood you use, 
when there's a mushroom mycelium that successfully colonizing, you can grow in your place. No problem. And Prof. Vicky can add on to that, actually. Anybody can grow the mushroom. Uh, yeah, uh, growing mushroom, um, there are a few uh, points to be taken care of. One is a substrate of the, the food that they are going to grow, give the mushroom to grow in. Normally, you will give plant-based uh, byproducts like straw or sawdust as a carbon source and maybe uh, rice bran or wheat bran as a nitrogen source. These are two very important. And because mushrooms, uh, the colonization of the mycelium grows very slowly compared to other saprophytic fungi like like trichoderma or any of the other soil-borne fungi, we have to sterilize the medium and introduce the, the spawn or the inoculum in a sterile manner to allow the mycelium or the hyphae to colonize and to be ready for uh, fruiting, right? So usually what people do is if you want to have something at home, you buy the ready kits, these are available. Many people sell these kits and then they bring it home, they keep it in a clean corner of their home and make conditions uh, suitable for fruiting. All right. And the other thing I would like to say here is because I uh, just now during my presentation, the last few, last few slides just ran. I, maybe I accidentally touched something. Uh, we also have Mushroom Research Center at the University of Malaya. This is supposed to be a center of uh, research and excellence concentrating on mushroom. We are about uh, 11 principal investigators and about 11 associated uh, investigators. And we have uh, studying all aspects of mushroom, all that can fit into a circular economy concept. I mean, starting with uh, waste material, either rice straw, or sawdust from rubber wood tree, we grow the mushroom, uh, harvested for fresh produce or for product formation. Then the spent mushroom compost is still very valuable. Uh, it, it's not a, it is considered as a byproduct mushroom production, but a lot of things can be done with the spent substrate. You can make fertilizer, you have to do uh, composting, vermicomposting. You can extract enzymes out of it. All right, and um, those enzymes can be used in bioremediation. And a lot of them are also exploring now um, fungal mycelium or mushroom mycelium as alternative packaging material, even uh, alternative uh, leather and other biomaterials. So um, I'm sorry, um, if you need to contact uh, Mushroom Research Center further, we have a page in Facebook. Center, or you can email me and I will direct you appropriately. Is there a chance of a mushroom pandemic? Just curious. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is uh, like the zombie fungi that Dr. Uh, Jaya just showed. A lot of insects which are colonized by this mushroom, uh, mainly escomycetes, they become, they lose control of their functions and they become like zombie. I think there is a movie also. Um, anything is possible with one, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Now, I mean, yeah, yeah. Pandemic, we never thought. So uh, I, what I believe is you respect nature. You, they are, you use them to help you. At the same time, you respect the way things operate in nature, and I think we should be okay. Not so easy to cause a mushroom pandemic <laughs> <laughs> for this moment, the knowledge that we have for this moment. Yeah, the mucormycosis is uh, coming a very hot topic now. Okay. Any questions? Mr. Kauda, you can ask the question. Now you can ask the question. Your voice is not clear. Go ahead, go ahead. Wow. 
While waiting, there's one question in the chat box. Is all mushrooms are good for year? Is it uh, to eat or you mean the year, our hearing organ? Can uh, Saurav uh, please clarify? Okay. Yeah, mushrooms, uh, many of them are, I mean, the edible ones are good to eat. Uh, different mushrooms have different functions. Um, all right. So, yeah, taste wise, all they differ from species to mushroom to mushroom. And we have a question from. Uh, Miss or oh, Mr. Gouda. Uh, can we have your question or command or? We are not clear. Mr. Gouda, your voice is not clear. Maybe you type in the questions and we can answer. Mr. Gouda, you can type your question in the chat box and it can be addressed. Going back to the question, are all mushrooms good to eat? I think they're all good to eat if you're looking at them as a protein source, all right, with some of the macro micronutrients, which are becoming very important, as well as some of the phenolic components and other antioxidants like the thiols. But if you're looking at their functional uh, attributes, suppose you want to eat the lion's mane mushroom, say good for the brain, good for cognition, then you have to pay attention to how you process, how you cook, so that you will gain the maximum functionality of that particular mushroom. Right. But you can enjoy all mushrooms, they are tasty. Right? You can cook them in different ways. Is uh, Gauda typing the question? Yeah. Shall we conclude, ma'am? Yeah. yeah okay. Madam, one more question in the chat box. Madam. Uh, example of a escomycete mushroom. Dr. Jaya, I think truffle is uh, escomycete. If I'm yeah, wrong. truffle and uh, motella. Yes, cordyceps. Yep, all of these are escomycetes. Yeah. Truffle, the most expensive mushroom. It's an escomycete. Yeah. Well, how long mushroom spores survive in the soil? Mm, that's a very tricky question. Uh, this depends. Some of them are rather short lived. Some, like some path pathogenic uh, mushrooms, can stay longer. Yeah. Some of them, like uh, the Ganoderma pathogen, oil palm, they say it has another, uh, another what we call host in the loop. That means they don't remain in the soil if, and the soil may not be suitable for them to germinate and to find partner and go on. So what they do, they spend their life in some other plant as a, in the root of the plant or on the, as a endo, endophytic organism until they find the right uh, partner or right situation to be able to do whatever they are supposed to do in the environment. What, which type of mushroom is best to eat during this time? What time is that, please? Is there any study real since a major? Oh, baby brain development. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. At this moment, I'm not sure. 
uh, I have to check. But if you email me, uh, then maybe you can check or you can Google up. I think you can find, you know, folic acid for brain development. Yeah, that's, that would be interesting to follow. You can most probably have to study in mice first, no? Oh, how will you differentiate between emerita peloids and mochella? Totally different uh, um, groups. Uh, they are totally different groups, uh, Mr. Srida, because emerita is under the basidiomycota, mochella is under the, uh, what do you call this, ascomycota. So they are totally different, uh, eight spot and four uh, spot, because they are both actually very poisonous for sure. Okay, but not all mochela is poisonous. Several mochela are edible. Thank you, ma'am and sir. Hello, madam. Uh, Mr. Gouda? Sir, your voice is not clear, Mr. Gouda. It's not coming through. Sir, you can type your question in the chat box. Yeah. Your voice is not clear. Mr. Gouda, is there any question? Ma'am, one more question from Sridhar, sir. If I remember right, they say the broken spores are more effective. So usually they will have to break open the spore wall. Now mushroom is like that. I think somebody asked a question earlier. Like it, uh, There is a difference between mycelium, footing body and spores. All right. So spores, especially in Ganoderma, are supposed to contain much more concentrated bioactive components or micro components compared to either mycelium or Ganoderma, that's, I mean the footing body. That's why they promote the use of the spore. But if you take the spore, unbroken spore, they say it, it cannot be broken down, cannot be broken down in our system to release the component. So most times they are uh, broken using some mechanical system before they are incorporated into the coffee or tea or any other product. Coming to milky mushroom will be cultivated in temperate zone using uh, substantiate your answer. Now milky mushroom, if I'm the calocybe indica is supposed to be a tropical mushroom, but you must remember, right? Initially it was uh, found in tropical, so now it's predominantly being grown in tropical countries. It doesn't mean it doesn't will not be able to go in the uh, temperate countries. Let me give you uh, an experience we had in our own lab. I'm sure many of you know the lion's mane mushroom, Ericium arenaceus, which is supposed to be very good for the brain, 
uh, stimulates neural growth, good for nerve regeneration, etc. And this is a temperate mushroom, grows mainly in China, Japan, and the cooler climates. When it first landed in Malaysia, it was also being grown in our highlands. But subsequently, we found that it can grow and fruit in a hotter climate. But there is some, what we call, some trade-off. Maybe the yield is lower. Maybe certain components are lower. And because a temperate mushroom was growing in a tropical country, we were curious whether all the functional attributes related to the central nervous system, that means effect on the nerves, effect on the uh, nerve recovery, will still be there growing at a higher temperature. And fortunate for us, we found though the mushroom was now fruiting in tropical country, it had not lost any of its attributes. However, the way we pro process the mushroom, that means if we oven dry at temperatures above 45, so we won't get neurite stimulating activity. All right, so it's not the cultivation technique here. It was more the processing of the fruiting bodies to retain the functionality. That's why I mentioned, we say mushroom is good, mushroom is good, but you must really sit back and think how it is grown, how it is processed. Because mushroom on its own cannot make all these components. You have to provide everything. Right? So these are things that we have to keep reminding ourselves. Okay? So why not? Maybe one day milky mushroom can be grown. Maybe not in the winter months, but in the summer months. Right? It's pretty warm. It can be grown in temperatures. So then I hope this answers your question. Ma'am, one final question, ma'am. Yeah. Is there any research in edible mushroom variety which can contribute towards improvement of health condition in COVID-19 patients? Um, I have seen some, pa uh, some papers where they are uh, saying that uh, can help COVID patients. You know, in COVID patients, there are some strategies. One is to stop the viremia, that means the multiplication of the virus. That means when it enters your cell, it shouldn't be able to penetrate and multiply. The other one is to mitigate the outcome, like uh, antioxidant, uh, damage, uh, inflammation, what we call cytokine storm. When we are undergoing the vi viral attack, there are lots of uh, cytokines are being produced and this cytokines will trigger inflammation and things like that. So those are the ones that are causing a lot of damage. Right at this moment, um, it's a bit risky for us to say, you eat mushroom and you'll be okay. But I think if you eat mushroom, overall, your own your own system may be in a better position to fight the virus, right? Because the components like immune modulation, there's antioxidant properties, right? But I cannot say uh, it will it will help you recover a lot, all right? Completely, we can't claim what they're doing, claiming with drugs, saying take this, and then uh, you know, you will not get severe. Maybe the severity can be reduced. A lot of reviews are there. I've seen reviews where people are speculating uh, uh, based on published data how mushrooms can help. So the only way is either you incorporate them in your diet or you can make a soup, right? Boil. Most of the time, the polysaccharides are in the water extract. Right. And many are also claiming like Ganoderma. Uh, there are publications indicating it will help. But all these lack what we call real uh, studies because we cannot work with the virus per se. And also uh, not many human trials to say yes. All I can say is eat mushroom, no harm done. Right? Maybe we'll be a little bit better defending ourselves against the virus than without mushroom. Have we answered Mr. Gaudam? He... Ma'am, 
Ma'am, Mr. Gowda's question is, how long mushroom spores survive in the soil if they are not getting favorable condi con condition? Okay, I, I think I answered that earlier. Yes, you have previously answered that question, ma'am, but he was not able to hear that. So he is repeatedly posting the question. But I think I typed in also somewhere, depending on the species. Maybe I have to elaborate a bit. Dr. Jaya, you have any info on spore survival in soil? In soil? No, problem. I think uh, it's very general uh, how he is asking that is uh, how mushroom spores survive in the soil. That means if it's a saprophytic, it depends on the nutrition mode of the fungi itself as well. Okay. Yeah, so in this case, uh, like as you say, the pathogenic fungi that travels, you know, underground the soil, it's with the hypo tip, they get too much of enzymes um, uh, in, inside the soil. So definitely there are, they, they, are, they are getting their favorable conditions through the interaction between the roots and also other particles from the soil. If they are, don't get the favorable condition, for example, uh, like oyster, okay, let's say oyster mushroom like uh, uh, gigantius, which is on the soil, right, like ni lack of nitrogen, then their nutritional mode will change from a saprophytic to a Carnivorism. Have you all heard about the carnivorism in mushrooms as well? Like the nematode trapping plant, they are carnivore plants, but in mushrooms also you have um, carnivorous mechanisms. So, uh, Ohemboelia, Pilerotus, and um, others, um, other groups uh, like Orbillaria on the, all the ascomycetes, they are all has this ability to trap the nematodes, you know, all the kind of and stuff like that. Did I answer your question, Mr. Gowda? Thank you, ma'am and sir. The essence of all beautiful act is gratitude. Now I request Dr. Sublakshmi Assistant Professor, Department of Microbiology, for a vote of thanks. Good afternoon to one and all gathered here. First of all, I thank our Almighty for a successful initiation of our Silver Jubilee celebration and completion of this international webinar. I submit my great words of gratitude, Dr. Vigneshwari Shabaratnam, ma'am, Professor, Mushroom Research Center, Institute of Biological Sciences, Faculty of Science, University Malaya, Malaysia. I express my sincere thanks to Dr. Jayasilan Satyasilan sir, Senior Lecturer, Researcher, Institute of Traffical Biology and Conservation, University of Malaysia, Shaba, Malaysia. My heartfelt thankfulness goes to our management, our chairman, Thirumadi Chennamal Ramaswamy, our vice chairman, Thir K.R. Krishnamurthy, our correspondent, Thir K.R. Arunachalam sir, for permitting to conduct this webinar. My indebted thanks uh, to our respected principal, Dr. S. Madhivan and sir, for his uh, continuous encouragement and guidance. My great regards to the head of microbiology department and my respected teacher, Dr. D. Kannan sir, for his constant support. I thank all of my colleagues, Ms., uh, Mrs. K. Nagajudi, Ms. Sain Merlin Sophia, Dr. M. Sanju Kumar, Dr. A. Parameshwari, and Ms., Mr. Mahesh for joining hands with their kind cooperation. My special thanks uh, goes to the participants uh, of India as well as abroad. My sincere thanks to all the HODs and faculty members of our college. My great thankfulness goes to computer science department of our college for their technical support. Once again, I thank one and all. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Thank you so much for having us. It's an honor to have joined you. Yes. Okay. Thank great, you. Great. great. And uh, thank you for inviting us. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. All the best for the rest of your celebration. Okay. Okay. Stay safe, everyone. We will meet another one international webinar, ma'am. Okay. We will meet another one international webinar or seminar. Where? You want? 
I'm not clear. I don't know what you're asking to do. We will meet another one international webinar or international seminar, ma'am. International okay. conference, anything else? Sure. sure. We'll keep you posted. Okay. Okay, yeah. ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Subo, for all I the communication. We do another one. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you for your blessings, madam. Thank you, everyone, for having us. I'm leaving the meeting now. Thank you, Thanks, madam. Lord. Thanks for all the effort. Thank Thanks Thank for you, having madam. us, allowing us to share. Thank you, madam. Okay, hope mushrooms will forge ahead as superfood. <laughs> Bye, Chabu. I'm leaving now. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Okay, we'll catch up later. Take care, everyone. Okay, okay ma'am. Okay, madam. Thank you.